to introduce it, I will hand the floor over to Christine Gordon. before you can explain just exactly what it meant. So I'm going to try and do it for you. And let me start, as I said, with the past, very recent past, since we don't have all day. Um, I want to um, call it some slides. I think this is the Yes. Uh, perhaps we can have some slides now. Oh, this is what I Thank you. Uh, this is a, uh, actually, this picture is hard to mean anything wrong, except it's a wonderful picture. Uh, a piece of sculpture was made by Manco Masconali, probably around 1910 or 1912. And uh, there's some of the, you know, the vision of the future, as it seemed uh, to me at that time. And I think it's really a beautiful future, a lot of wonderful ladies and uh, beautiful airplane and all that stuff as well. Anyway, the future hasn't turned out to be quite that way. Really, you know, really Until the advent of popular democracy in Europe and North America some 200 years ago, architecture, which is really the only thing that you and I are always about, uh, existed almost exclusively for the amusement of the rich and the famous and for the purpose of um, uh, decorating their power the purpose of keeping order in their face. This is a painting by a man called Gary Bear Francesca in the 15th century, Italian painter, at least they think it was done by him, and it's a painting of an ideal city, as it seemed to him and 
his contemporary at that time. And as you can see, it is a very well organized, very well structured uh, kind of image. The center is a palace or a cathedral or something like that. And right in the center of that, of course, is the doorway from which the big trees, whether you would hope or prince, would uh, make his appearance. And uh, the buildings, the secondary buildings, were grouped around this in a very symmetrical fashion. Um, it was symmetrically arranged, surrounded by the houses of the rich and famous and the powerful, with a symmetrical facade, because of course you could always tell who was really important, because it would appear in that type of doorway. In a less style romantic city scape, uh, you would have a beautiful skyline, similar to this of the town of Rino in Italy, or the town of Carcassonne in France. A skyline in which you would see, if you look closely enough, the two uh, most important symbols of power, the cathedral, which was, of course, the symbol of religious power, and the palace, the symbol of military power. Nothing else really mattered. The servants who worked for the popes and the princes lived in stone buildings, uh, which seem to us actually beautiful today, of course, but seemed very modest at the time. Stone boxes with tile roofs. Um, and the peasants who provided food for those inside the walls lived outside the fortress, who assembled the bay to mark the squares next to the cedar in the palace to feed the city world. This is one of those market squares in the town of Luca in Italy, not far from Pisa. And you get the general idea to see the cathedral, of course, was a symbol of religious power, very important, clearly a very important building, by the way, which was in the very nature of its detail, its color, and everything else. Uh, and the buildings all around it were those of the people who served the princes and the popes and everyone else. It was all very simple and unmistakably clear. There was absolutely no doubt as to who was who and what was what who was important and who was not. And the cities and the buildings reflected this all the things very clearly. But then it came the great popular revolutions of 200 years ago, and suddenly everything began to change. Suddenly architecture began to be designed and lived and built as if ordinary people died. That's what we're marked by here. And this is a picture of um, Tangle Hall Marketers in Boston. An area that has been revitalized and re reconstructed recently, but it's clearly a very kind of democratic uh, uh, city. All of a sudden, as you can see, the shapes of our buildings and our, of our towns and cities were formed by entirely new facts and entirely new traditions. And the speed is what all of this happened. The rate of change that suddenly began to govern life on Earth, these became absolutely mind boggling I think that. It's important for me to just go over this very quickly because uh, it's something we tend to forget. In the past century, over the past, uh, over a period of only about a dozen years, the planet Earth experienced the following really extraordinary innovations. Every single one of them uh, important enough and dramatic enough to change everything about the way we live in our cities, our suburbs, and our countries. In 1877, which is when all hell began to break loose. We saw the invention of the telephone. Now, most people who were alive then thought that the telephone was another one of those gadgets that might be fun to have around for a couple of months or so, which wouldn't really change life on Earth in any significant manner. Needless to say, this little innovation in 1877 continued to change just about everything about the shapes, the sizes, and also the uses of our cities, our streets, our buildings, about the nature of our world and by the rest of our lives. And that was only the beginning. In 1880, in 1880, only three years later, somebody invented the incandescent map. And that changed because the way we were able to use our cities, our streets, our squares, and everything else. And five years after that, someone invented the trolley uh, car. And after that, uh, one year after that, in 1816, the first subway. And three years after that, came the first elevator. This is a patent office drawing of that, which is a general idea of uh, what people thought of the area of IQ, did of course make it possible to build very small buildings. And then, in 1889, when it was, came the first automobile. And I'm quite sure that people began to pay attention when something like this came rolling down the street. Now, I should probably explain what, what I'm showing you here. 
This is a, a drawing from the U.S. Patent Office, and it shows one of the uh, patents uh, close there of how automobiles might look. And the person who designed this particular uh, device saw quite rightly the horses, uh, which would slow down the streets, <laughs> or you know, pulling various wagons and so on, would be very upset if they suddenly saw something come down the street that would go by the horse. So he thought that the thing to do was clearly was to make automobiles look like horses, and that's what he did. Now, of course, um, nothing, nothing uh, that had ever happened on the face of the earth so completely changed uh, the nature of life on earth, the nature of our city and the earth. So you can see some of our cities today are probably occupied by automobiles and by facilities uh, dedicated to the automobile to something like 40% of the total surface of the city. These facilities, highways like this, highways like that one, in Tokyo, uh, simply slash through our cities, destroying everything inside, everything around them, uh, creating those terrible fumes, terrible noises, uh, incredible crowding, and incredible uh, conditions of non confrontation and separation. Nothing has changed the face of the earth as dramatically, as radically, as rapidly as this one simple event. A man made environment forever. Better, probably for worse, than any of them, nothing on earth will ever be quite the same. Um, I'm going to go back and come to this slide in just a minute. Now, all of these dramatic innovations, the telephone, the incandescent arm, the electric trolley car, the subway, the elevator, the automobile, all of these were invented over a period of about 12 years. And since that time, there have been innumerable other inventions seem to fit with to have very little to do with architecture. But really it shaped our cities and our buildings very significantly. There has been a direction of the airplane cost, which is wrong, wrong and all kinds of other innovations. There were innovations in medicine, one of which was the the uh, compass of tuberculosis in 1940, which made it unnecessary to build the kinds of cities that the policy had in mind when we built its new design is uh, ideal cities, radiant cities, about 1922, uh, when he tried to propose a kind of city in which sunlight and fresh air and breezes and so on would uh, wipe out all of the uh, terror that the plague was supposed to be, which was frightening people uh, all over the world. And um, there were many changes in other areas as well. In uh, the creation, <coughs> when I was when I was very really interested in football, I don't know. The, uh, many of us thought that one of the most important things to accomplish in American cities was to recapture the use of waterfront, uh, places like New York, where Boston, Philadelphia, and San Francisco, and so forth, had beautiful waterfront, but you couldn't get to it because the merchant shipping occupied all of it, there were great wharfs and uh, merchant ships. And then the um, unions that uh, worked in Chicken uh, directed to it and fought the open arm courthouse again. Now, all of a sudden, about 20 years ago, continuous shipping, totally a uh, new idea of uh, technology for development, came into being, and all of a sudden, literally overnight, all the water parts in American cities uh, were open up. It was possible to build uh, parks playgrounds, housing, all kinds of things, directly on the water, improve the downtown nature of downtown areas, very significant. And there were many other uh, innovations, of course. One of the most important ones, probably, was uh, the introduction of all kinds of uh, communications technology, made it possible for people to work at home, and more and more people in the United States are at home. This is a process of uh, and we were going to the in the And uh, there are many of these things that have affected other aspects of that as well. Um, some of the ways in which communications technology has started to affect our way of working, our way of spending our days, uh, instead of spending the traffic jams trying to get to 
การทำโลกะครับนะผมมั่นสิแต่แต่แต่วินาทีเป็นมากกว่าทางโครงเดียวกันคุณทำได้ช่วยทำได้ดีกว่าแอนด์เดย์ดีเดย์ดีเดย์ดีเดย์ดีเดย์ดีเดย์ All of these dramatic changes in many others transform the nature of our picture completely. Because, as we all know, uh, something else simply had been also. Uh, specifically, uh, the place that we were living on at the time was becoming awfully crowded. As most of you know, uh, the population of the planet Earth in the year 1900 stood at about 1.6 billion people. Now, 1.6 billion, uh, it's definitely not so many people now, but that was the largest, that was more than the sum of all human beings who had ever lived on this planet prior to that day, for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and yet, in those years, in the first decades of the century, towns like this one in France, how we uh, might look like this one. Uh, very shortly thereafter, I took this picture. And this is the time that happened, particularly in 1996. Now, more than an hour, 100 years after the initial Things that I gave in 1900, uh, when we had 1.6 billion people And now, in mid 2000, we will have five years from now, we expect to have a population of about 6.3 billion. In other words, in this century alone, the population of this planet will have quadrupled. And in another 100 years, <coughs> unless there are some hideous disasters in the world, that figure will probably explode with about 10 billion or 12 billion. Perhaps we'll all be living on here. Well, I am uh, sorry if I'm taking too much time to set the stage, as we go to what I'm going to say about architecture in the next century. But nothing has been going on now in the design of cities as uh, carried out and proposed by people who are really serious about this field of architecture because it's been a new pattern. Similar to the images that we run with, the people who are really serious about the future of mankind, nothing that's been going on is as important uh, as dealing with the horrendous problems that are staring us in the face. And that is why the only important objects of the past few seem to be envisioned as people who believe that they must design for a new kind of human habitat on a new kind of planet with new technologies that will change just about everything in the man made environment. There were quite a few men and women, of course, in the past few years uh, who offered such agreements. But I would like to talk about only two of them who believe uh, they did more than any other uh, upwards in these years to give up a vision uh, to make the inspire. The first of them was the Corbusier, who was born in Switzerland in 1887, worked rather in Paris, and died in the south of France in 1965. This picture was taken in Marseille in 1952, when I was there. And building behind it is the Marseille apartment building, which huge building was about 350 apartments, with many offices, shops, and so on. There is other facilities, which he was then completing uh, on the edge of Marseille, the edge of the train. It was an extraordinary building, 17 stories high, about 400 feet long, and still one of those remarkable works of modern art. In the century. And the second was Mies van der Rohe, uh, usually referred to as Mies, who was born in January 1886 and spent the last 30 years of his life, uh, largely in the years in Chicago, where this picture was taken in 1969. Now these two changed the shapes of our buildings in our city to the 20th century like no other two outfits in the time. And I think that their work would shape our in the Let me start with the Corbusier's work. In 1928, Le Corbusier and his uh, cousin Pierre Paulet were asked to design two buildings 
in an ideal city, it was then being built in uh, southwest Germany, in the East Stuttgart. And you probably use the occasion to, to uh, make a kind of statement of principles that the government has worked in subsequent 40 years. And here are three or four points that they have. If you work this out and then you make these lovely inspections, this is of course a cross section through a typical building of that the sort that he was thinking of. And he made his points in those sketches of the words. First he said there was now a possibility, a technical possibility, of raising buildings off the ground on tall, widely spaced columns, which you call POG. And if you did this, he said, uh, it would become possible for pedestrians to walk right through under buildings on a, on a park, on a level of parks and uh, playgrounds and so on. In fact, in effect, through the all of which would completely change the traffic patterns and cities and the very nature of streets and squares. The second, the second notion, this I think is of course another view of the Marseille building, which shows that on its POT, on its the columns, which are 28 feet high, and it's very large, very high space under the building, uh, and people can walk right through it, under it, and so on, from one side, from the other. Um, he believed that we could put all on the rear traffic, the elevated highways, and connect buildings to another view of that same, the same field, the under the same And we would connect, and this is one of the first drawings we made of an ideal city, we would be able to connect highways, uh, connect these buildings by elevated highways with them take care of the cars. Um, the um, cities themselves were tall buildings, open to the sky, open to the sun and the breezes, and, and uh, the moves and so on. They would all be connected at a pedestrian level in parks and so forth. And this fourth point, third or fourth point, was that it was now quite easy to top off, to top off our flat roof buildings with uh, all kinds of playgrounds, communal parks with gardens on heaven. Recapturing, in a sense, recapturing the footprint occupied by the buildings themselves in the landscape of the city. Now this is the uh, roof garden, part of the roof garden, very large roof garden, on top of the Monsey building, which I showed you earlier. And while uh, all of the company's ideas, the notions of some very practical and very sort of functional and realistic and all that, you see that there's something extraordinary artists because of something very beautiful about this roof garden. It has to do with the fact that the parapet, which is at the level of about five feet above the level of the uh, roof, and cuts off all the surroundings of the city and leaves only the, the uh, mountains, the foothills of the, of the maritime Alps, which you see all around. And of course, in the distance, you see the islands of the Mediterranean. And it is an extraordinary experience because it feels that you are kind of floating, floating platform in the air in this beautiful landscape. Now, uh, he finally said that the buildings that he imagined for this new Indian city might all be built out of a framework of steel and concrete columns. And this framework would then be filled in with three concrete boxes that would form the, the apartment. This picture happens to be of uh, Monte Safdie's habitat now uh, at Mont Blanc 67, or 67. But they're very, they were all based on the drones of the years. And this is another building uh, down for Olivetti in Italy, in northern Italy, in which all the uh, units you can see are, are steel, aluminum, and glass, and plastic prefab uh, units, each of them an apartment, each of them forming uh, a guest apartment in this uh, hotel that we built for a little, uh, in the 1980s, I think. Well, the, the uh, parties, these prefabricated boxes were formed parties or uh, offices or classrooms or whatever, but they could be mass produced and they could be inserted into that framework. Now, the basic notion of the to be mass produced and prefabricated and so on, this was not really made out by the corporate himself, over the 40 years or so before he died, probably by architects, early designers all over the world. Um, here, by the way, is a building, another building by the Corbusier. This is the secretary, which he did in Chandigarh, now in India, which 
conceive the framework of learning is a concrete and whatever it goes into the framework, is, the idea is that you can insert almost anything into that framework and the, the, the building of the concrete perfect purpose. Here is the same building, Secretary completed uh, by 1960. <coughs> the uh, workman who did his work in the time of work in the building to all ride the bicycles, and so this picture is a sea early in the morning. Thousands of work in the morning and uh, work into the building to come back. Now, this is the kind of city that we hope to get in mind. It happens to be one of the things I had right after World War II. It was a new town of saint in eastern France. And um, as you can see, the center of it is meant to be a cultural and civic center, the city hall with a with museum, with a municipal building, and all the rest. And around that, there have been tall buildings, slide like buildings for apartments, low buildings for schools, and the center and so on. And then kind of the women have dealt with around the center, so that access to this central court from the outside. And uh, all of the, uh, in, inside that building area, the, the uh, ground floor, the words, parks and playgrounds, and the landscape, um, the landscape uh, area, they really in good space. The, uh, the idea of the tall building space car, car, car and, and put into a car set was copied all over the world. This happens to be in Boston, um, a very new project, not very uh, fortunate perhaps, but it, was, it, it shows you simply that there was a great deal of the influence of the these sketches was enormous. And it became, by 1940, the basic idea that the, the battle against tuberculosis was no longer so serious a matter. Uh, he was able to build in a very different way, and he did propose buildings in the United cities of the Great Configuration. Now, as you can see, the Gopi was uh, very serious about the realities of life on the Earth, crowding, uh, disease, and all the rest. The realities of those 12 billion human beings at the end of the next century, and the realities of urban sprawl and other environmental disasters. But there was another aspect to his work, and I'd like to talk about that. Excuse me for breaking this up, and I saw a story for some reason like this, with my voice and the detail to hear. Um, the community, as you know, started out as a painter and a sculptor, a member of a radical new group of previous painters and sculptors of Paris. In fact, when he decided to work most of his life, the architect who changed his name from the Jeanne to the Corbusier, which was the name of his maternal grandmother. And uh, but his earliest work is like this one, the painting done by 1918, which is in the Museum of Modern Art. These uh, are all seen as part of the previous movement in France of those years. As you can see, it is clear what this is. It's still life with some music instruments and a few other things that I saw. But all the elements are very hard edged, very sharp, very precise geometric elements, very much like elements of the machine. Because to be modern in the first decades of this century was that you believe, meant that you believe that the machine was the outcome of our age. And to look you see, for several decades, the machine was the supreme image. Um, he used this photograph in one of his first books. It's the front view, the radiator of a data of a French automobile. And I think perhaps it was breathtaking. So beautiful. I, could, I wish that I had I wish I had a car like this. Uh, at least I wish that I had a photograph of this uh, You see, every element of that car are separately articulated. Every one of them is exposed. It's very precise, very geometric, very hard edge, very, very clean, very neat, and very clearly understand how it works and so forth. And the idea that the machine as the supreme one was as important as the tree and the flower had been to operate in our world in the late 19th century, or even more so. One of the uh, things that always amazed me about this particular period is that not only after 
also artists of every configuration, every kind of point of view, seem to have a basic understanding. They all uh, shared certain aspects of uh, the way we, all of us, were looking at the world as um, the world that was here. For example, you would have a painter, like Fanon Major, who was painted, who made this painting of the city uh, by 1918. And you see that it is the same kind of painting that the Cubans the Gorgesian did, and it relates very closely to the kind of thing, the kind of image between the and the other objects. It's a geometric composition, a composition of geometric form. And they all um, add up to a, a new world, a world of machinery, of mass production, and all the rest. Uh, everything on Earth is going to be transformed by the machine, automobiles, automobiles, prefab buildings, airplanes, communication technology, and all the rest. They were completely the forces of the shaping of our lives. And so the image of the machine became the inspiration of architects and artists equally, and they were all in complete um, harmony with each other. This is a building, an office building in Munich, started by, in the 1960s by a husband and wife team of architects and unfortunately, I keep getting the names, but I think it's wonderful. I don't know what exactly goes on there. I think it probably doesn't work all that well, but it's clearly a piece of machinery. It's a marvelous, a hardware, beautiful piece of machine out of this world. And this is the building which was done by Kenzo Kami, a Japanese artist in Tokyo. It's headquarters for a corporation. I've seen the building, it's very, it's on a very tiny site. You know, we talked about all the building sites and ten square feet and stuff like that. And it is a crash. So you need the crank, the cylindrical element in the middle is complete elevators and stairs. And then can't be allowed to use uh conference rooms and all the rest. Mm -hmm. It's headquarters go very inefficient on the ESA point of view of the marvelous piece of machine art, if you like. Um, but sometime in the late 1930s. The Corbusier and others, uh, who I should first talk for a moment about this, and the Corbusier did, um, and, and his associate, the old woman called Charles Cannon, designed some furniture. Uh, this chair being one, designed in 1928, and I'm very lucky um, to have two of these in my possession. And they are made, as you can see, they're made of uh, chrome plated steel. They have very sharply pointed screws and bolts and so on. They have uh, all kinds of uh, um, spiral uh, things going on, and they are extremely dangerous to sit in. Uh, what happens is you know, you sit down, and, and the person happens with these spirals, the springs, the steel springs, catch your sleeve and tear off your, uh, your arm. And then you find that your pants go. Come on down the uh, Anyway, the whole thing is a disaster. They are, they're just the most beautiful object that we have. And we wouldn't sick of sitting in this place. We own them for about 40 years now. And I was having them in the first week or two. And since then, I've been able to get a lovely leather chest of wood, very soft, very comfortable, very 19th century. And that's what I said. And I let my friends and visitors say, please. And, uh, this is another piece of machinery, machine art, which we call it in the Pelopeyon design in 1928. It's another chair, and it's this one that actually lifted from the bottom of that way. And then you get lifted out again. It doesn't have quite so many uh, screws and nails and sharp edges and stuff like that, but it does have spirals and springs, and it does tell you shreds. Well, so much for that. Uh, but sometime in the 1970s, the company seemed to undergo some kind of conversion. He wrote 1978 of their and at one point, I decided to show up in the to nature in my form. And he began by developing this scale, this proportional scale, which is called a modern one. I don't know about it. But uh, while I'm trying to explain to you, great lengths and much sophistication, by your teachers, I can show you that 
a very dear friend of mine who used to work for Coco in those days, has told me uh, repeatedly that nobody would go to his office except for Coco ever understood what the things were all about. Uh, it was a supposedly this figure is that of a man with his hand raised, and that is the ceiling height of the typical uh, human habitat. Well, in this room, <laughs> probably to be silent, but uh, he, uh, he was, uh, and then he decided that figure, you see, could be divided in some proportion of the system, and that the proportions of this, these divisions, would govern everything in the building, including the height of the window cells, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. And none of it made absolutely any sense whatsoever. I was working for the whole year, but anyone who's tried to understand it since. Now, but still, here he was, this uh, apostle of the female of the Euclidean platform, and he was starting to make all kinds of things that were clearly organic, they were like human figures. This is an imprint which appears in practically all of the homes he's built. This happens to be the part of the building in West Berlin in 1957, I think. And um, he kept referring to suddenly kept referring to natural forms in all of his work. Most of all, uh, he began to make buildings that had completely uh, that had completely removed themselves from the geometric discipline of historical work. Lee Sandro, who admired the Corsi a great deal, thought that his friend must have lost his marbles. And he probably supposed that this would work on Fifth Avenue, he once asked him, finding that his picture of Pontron, Chapel of Pontron. Well, of course, uh, Chapel had been designed for Fifth Avenue, exactly. Designed for a building of the world of France, where it looked absolutely beautiful, but at least a really, and a part of the least of my machine. But still, here he was doing these buildings all the time. And by this time, you know, he was almost through with his life. He knew it was this month of 52. Another 15 years he was dead. And he was beginning a completely new language of beauty. This is the interior of Hong Kong. This is another exterior, which uh, uh, shows you he's trying to get the form of wind from the mountains and stuff like that. But very organic forms, and nothing to do with the future of the And here is another one of those forms. Um, and in India, in all of his work in India in the 1950s, he was influenced by natural forms, by images that he'd seen in the streets of India and the countryside. So forth. This is the canopy over the entrance to the general assembly, the parliament building, which contains the two chambers of the uh, Kundali Park. And this uh, canopy uh, is a place where rainwater is gathered, overflows through that scuttle that you see into the pool that's outside the building. And the shape of that canopy uh, is the shape of Forms of the horns of oxen that Bukowski had sketched. He drew all the time. Everywhere he went, he had drew on some. Um, I remember once in, in East Hampton uh, during the war, sorry, during the years after the war, when uh, the United Nations was being planned in New York, Bukowski was staying out near East Hampton on Long Island uh, with a, a very close friend of mine. And um, on the morning that he left, he uh, as a thank you uh, to his friends in his house in the state. He painted two large murals in the living room. He started about five in the morning and he left at seven, by which time he found two beautiful works of curious painting. Well, he was then uh, using all kinds of forms with the when he said it you mentioned things like this uh have a lot of lateral form from the skylights or the on the chambers. On the roof, he has another view of it. And he was, uh, and he has still another view of that same time. You see, forms where some of them were still quite geometric, quite high there, but they were becoming increasingly organic themselves. And he was building the Palace of Justice opposite the 
apartment building in Chandigarh. And this is a picture on the side of the tanky of the entrance to the ice crust. So all of the color, all of the forms of the tanky are organic. They're like enormous drones, drones of um, hundreds of thousands of years ago, diamonds and so on and so on. They're not at all a geometric or the quality. I think I did something wrong. My slides don't seem to be clear. And here is his starlight, uh, which uh, he did in the late 50s. He built a monastery uh, in uh, France. And the, in the monastery, the monastery building is a relatively geometric building, but in the basement of this building, that I'll go to that, and there is a chapel. Beautiful chapel, and these stars, these very sort of morphogenic uh, families sticking up to us, are skylights that light up the chapel in their basement. So you see, um, there was a time, about that time, when um, the Corbusier was trying to define architecture, and he was talking about architecture being a magnificent play of forms in light. Um, definition of vector mode for almost everything. But as you can see in this very simple chapel, which the surfaces are all concrete and plastic, which are painted in the bright colors of previous art, which is nothing artificial, no decoration. He was able to achieve, I think, a point the loveliness of form, the light, and the shape, and so on, which is much more elaborate works today, doing very quickly at all. But in some respects, Mies van der Rohe was much less inventive, much less surprising in an aspect than what he did. This is a photograph taken of Mies probably about 1910 in Venice. He was uh, not a painter or a sculptor, although he was a very close friend of painters like Paul Clay. And although these buildings may seem exceedingly geometric and rational and analytical to most of us, they had certain irrational or poetic qualities as well. And uh, it's difficult to describe, and I think that uh, I'm going to show you a few that will show you that some general. This was an early 1920 or 1918 project for a site that looked like this. This is another one. Uh, again, very sort of. Uh, and geometric and morphic. And uh, plan, which I had, but not the most, uh, and very different, very different in form from buildings that we do later. But uh, he was beginning to uh, explore other forms, other forms of the functional ones. One of those accidents, accidents, of course, governed on architecture in the, from its very beginning, was Louis Sullivan's form for his country. And although Salman really didn't believe in it all that much, it, um, he seemed to suggest that people uh, should be following a uh, function in designing buildings. It was becoming uh, clear, though, that the buildings, look, our buildings had a sort of real life, a real life that might be one generation or two generations on, but then after that, they might change their occupancy or function was completely. And therefore, that the, the idea of having a building that was uh, going to be formed and targeted by its initial function didn't seem to make an awful lot of sense. One of the better museums in Paris, and if you look around us today, were one of the better museums in Paris used to be a railroad city. And some of the best museums in Italy are uh, formed palaces or cathedrals. And some of the best apartment buildings in the US are converted public schools, maybe about 1900. And there are many other buildings that sold because the Shaker, the Shaker meeting house was converted and redesigned and turned into a library. And I think it makes a better library than the old it was as a meeting house. And the School of Architecture that I attended at the University of Pennsylvania when I first started out uh, had been designed earlier, it was an old building, it had been designed something like 50 years earlier as a school of dentistry. And uh, it was pretty hideous. 
but uh, there's nowhere near as bad, nowhere near as bad as the uh, hideous crops, the awful crops that we now have as a school of Africa. Building them is really designed to be a school of Africa, and it looks like a kind of maximum security prison, both outside and inside. It's absolutely awful. But the one that we uh, started in was wonderful. I don't know what they called it, awful the school of Africa, but it was kind of great and marvelous. Well, he did many, many buildings that are still quite popular. A building that single building in which the occupants could change things every day, and they can every week and every month, and of course they did. But there were many things that he designed in those early years and all through his life which really were formed more by aesthetic considerations than by any functional concern. This is a, a building he designed, which is all about a great country house. The plan of it, of course, is very similar to a painting on one ground, an asphalt painting on one ground. And the open spaces that are formed by these brick walls are all meant to be for the I don't know if that would work if it was a house, maybe it's a museum, or maybe a library or something else. But there's a lovely work of art. And uh, it is very much influenced by Mondrian's paintings, which, of course, everyone in Europe knew it. There was a building that Nice did in 1930 in Czechoslovakia, and uh, I was lucky to be uh, in Czechoslovakia in the 1960s. And what was then a very really useful comment structure about Czechoslovakia. I went to see for Nice one of those two and a half hours which this one is, in the town of Luna, which was very close to Vienna. And he built this in 1930. I went to see what was left of it. The house had been damaged quite severely uh, during World War II, and it had not been very well restored. And the design originally was to as a very elegant villa, as you can see in the photographs, for a wealthy Czech family. But now the communists have transformed it into a gym for handicapped children, a rehabilitation center for handicapped children. I took quite a few pictures of it. This is the way used to be when we discussed the time. And this is the way we go with all those kids face including the exercise. Now when I went back to the US, I went to see these in Chicago and showed them some of my sites. I wasn't sure if you'd be very swell by what the communists had done to his lovely house, but I was quite wrong. He was swell. You see it works equally well either way. So given the political situation, I guess they had to paint it in order to get Well uh, he had been developed in a tiny new modern theory. Formal functions were no longer inseparable at all. They were, according to me, quite independent of one And the people who wanted to use the building as a piece of design and built were entirely free to use it in whatever way that they saw fit. <coughs> they were going to do it in any case, regardless of what they might intend. And he was moved, moved in the direction of beautiful anomalous structures. Um, almost from the start. This is a building which he did in 1928 and 1929, the Barcelona Pavilion, for the work for the fair, uh, World's Fair, Barcelona, right here, German Pavilion. And this is the way it looked initially. And then it was rebuilt about six or eight years ago. And here it is the way I saw it uh, about six or eight years ago. Exactly rebuilt, exactly, and uh, beautiful. Now, what was it? It's a bit of a functional. I think it was a place in which the King of Spain would arrive, shake uh, hands with President of the Bahamas Republic, and opening the end, that was the end of the country. The plan, by the way, of this building is again a beautiful painting. It is not particularly functional, I suppose. The entrance was at the top, the middle one is a gap between these two surrounding walls. That's where the King came in. And there is Rafi waiting from outside, the president of it. The family stood, stood there and took a hand, uh, offered a glass of champagne, and they pushed it each other and then came to the left. Well, building, building was torn down when it has not been built. And it is, this is the way it looked in the It's a beautiful space, completely anonymous, completely open capable of receiving any kind of function, a wonderful place in which people can live, and the 
you might want to read the poem, something like that. Uh, and this is the way it looks today. And it is really full of reflections, full of spaces that seem to merge into each other, full of mysterious uh, connections between basically and so on. Sculpture by a German sculptor called Kalbe, it has been uh, re remade, recast in models, and it still is in that new day, which now is the last level. But the, the, he was getting more and more farther and farther away from functionalism, and doing buildings which really were uh, free to, to fulfill almost any kind of thing. This is the building that he did, the house that he did outside Chicago in 1953 for a friend of his that he was found with. And it's a glass and steel structure, very beautiful, uh, completely open, and really capable of accepting almost any kind of thing. And this is the School of Architecture, the IIT, a building that may be better than yours. And it is a building, completely open space, and almost anything for pack. The years before he died, he painted this building, the uh, International Gallery in West Berlin. It's a building in which the, uh, the outside went from 280 feet square. They supported the roof, was supported by eight columns. Uh, the roof was prefabricated on the ground, and then ironically lifted on those columns to a height of about 270 feet. And um, this is the way the building was inside at night. It's a huge open space in which any kind of exhibit can take place. He had designed a very similar kind of structure for Anna Cuba, but uh, Castro arrived before the work of the book. So uh, it was a museum. Structure in Cuba was to be to be a, a, a office building. This is the building in Berlin. It is so anonymous, it's so abstract, it's so beautiful is a remote reality in a sense, then it becomes a very poetic statement. You see there, these reflections of the sky, the sun, the light, of people, trees, plants, and so on. These are all kind of wonderful images that uh, he's trying to he's trying to affect in this building, and I think it's probably good. Now, so now I think we have this extraordinary legacy that work of the property what we call to determine this series of pictures of the Gobzi in East Hampton Long Island after World War II. And then the uh, roof lay down on the Marseille building. And the a master of form, I think, which is what he was, who created buildings with such passion that they really go far beyond functional buildings. Buildings very ordinary modern materials. Stuff, tire and so on. And the, 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 the so modern in the way they dress the human spirit uh, that they speak to us more clearly than anything else. And we see buildings of this kind by these in beautiful new natural lab in West Berlin. Building such precision, such clarity, such was such a totally constant change in the light, the shade, the reflection of the clouds, the sky, the trees, and the world. Then it becomes a, a kind of a poem, an abstract poem. Poem. There's another photograph of the corner of that building. And you see, it has a certain magic in it which is very difficult to. Time. Only a very few photographs have ever been taken to explain how beautiful, elegant, mysterious this story really is. Well, it's that, and it's the Cozy's work, this extraordinary building, this very profound work, foothold of the Himalayas, an extraordinary building, 800 feet long.
the East, the Punda, the Kamiya is the capital of the Punda. The Punda is currently uh, in real trouble because Sikhs and Hindus are fighting over the Punda. And so the city has not been very okay. I was there about a year ago then, and uh, it was not as good as it might have been. But uh, the city that was designed to house 150,000 is now has been close to 70. That is 20 years after, 7 years after that time. And in that city, in the center of that city, these will be the last two sides. Uh, the Kobuzi <coughs> planned to build the one money, people said it would be the money of the open hand, a huge start of the open hand, and turn that weather for big breezes. And it would be a symbol of friendship openness to the world, friendship among people, among people with different relations, different backgrounds uh, in India and elsewhere. And this was one of the many sketches that we made. We made sculptures too, one of them had in hand. And but then he, uh, I thought it was very good. And when I went back to that one year ago, I, of course, I went directly to the center of that one. And suddenly I saw this extraordinary thing. There it was. It had been built. It had been built after his death. He left the very precise building. In this hand, the whole thing is about 120, 120 uh, The hand is made of steel. It, it sits on this pole. It turns in the wind. It's creaking inside. It's very, very silent. It's very, it's very, very scary. And it is a kind of thing. I think the policy will much need. Well, when the policy needs to be activated about the form and function were considered indivisible. If the building didn't work, it wasn't going to work. Fifty years later, they demonstrated that two factors, form and function, could exist independently, side by side, united by a common bond, and that is power. Perhaps that is what Paul Ryan meant when he said that the future isn't what used to be. Perhaps it's not. We can never know. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening. I would be happy to answer any 